So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Ensuring changes in emergency powers and public health authority will protect public health. Brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Charles Strong, Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on the network's website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. We strongly encourage attendee participation, so feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop down menu and send us your question. We'll be addressing them during the Q&A session towards the end of today's event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Donna Levin. Donna is the National Director of the Network, where she oversees organizational strategy and operations. Before joining the network, Donna spent 26 years as General Counsel at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, where she had oversight of Office of General Counsel and led her team in providing guidance on statutory and regulatory authority, the development of major policy initiatives of the department, and legislation affecting public health. Donna will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So, Donna, over to you. Great. Thank you, Charles, and thank you to everyone joining us today. So, we at the Network for Public Health Law and our colleagues in public health law and practice are troubled by the implications and consequences, some deliberate and others unintended, of proposed laws and judicial rulings that impact public health authority. So I'm really very grateful today to Jill Krieger for organizing this webinar to do a deep dive into the landscape and issues on this topic, and to our fellow panelists, Jen Piat and Lindsay Wiley, for joining us today, and who I will introduce now. So Jennifer Piat is senior attorney for the Network for Public Health Law in our Western Region office. Jen is a senior attorney and serves as also a research scholar with the Center for Public Health Law and Policy at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Jill Krieger is director of our Network for Public Health Law Northern Region office and her current work involves climate adaptation and mitigation, the farm bill and agricultural policy, rural health, oral health, literacy, and mental health promotion in school and community settings. Lindsay Wiley is our third presenter, and she is a professor of law and director of the health law and policy program at American University Washington College of Law. Her research focuses on access to health care and healthy living conditions in the U.S. and globally. And with that, I'll hand it over to our first speaker, Jen Piat. Thanks, Donna. Good morning to everyone on the West Coast and a good afternoon to those in the East. Uh, as Donna said, my name is Jen Pyatt and uh, my colleagues and I on this webinar are so thrilled to, to speak to you all today about what we've been seeing legislatively and judicially throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start us off by discussing some recent scholarship uh, assessing individual rights-based challenges to COVID-19 social distancing orders, which my co-authors and I have termed COVID's constitutional conundrum. And I'd like to take a brief moment here to just acknowledge and thank my co-authors on the piece, uh, James G. Hodge Jr., Hannah Ranke, and Emily Carey. The resulting article will be published in the Tennessee Law Review later this year, but it is currently available for download on SSRN. Uh, today, my principal objectives for our discussion involve assessing the unprecedented public health responses and economic impacts tied to COVID-19 and the resulting wave of litigation alleging rights-based infringements uh, by public health measures. To start, I'm going to just briefly take us through the facts of the once in a century pandemic that we all find ourselves in. So some rather alarming trends are on the slide before you. The graphs show the global COVID-19 cases and deaths on that incredible increase beginning in March 2020 
and lasting throughout the year. Uh, both have started to dip a bit towards the beginning of 2021, but the numbers have again started to climb. Uh, the public health impacts of COVID-19 in the U.S. particularly are incredibly profound. The U.S. accounts for almost you know, 23, 24% of the cases in the world and almost 20% of the deaths, despite the fact that the U.S. only houses 4% of the global population. So these numbers help to illustrate just how much the U.S. struggled to respond to and control the virus's spread. Attempts to combat COVID-19 arose at all levels of government. The federal government's Department of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency initially on January 31st, 2020, followed up with a PREP Act declaration on February 4th, freeing up liability protections for medical countermeasures used to respond to the virus. On March 13th, then President Trump issued declarations of emergency pursuant to both the Stafford Act and the National Emergencies Act. And on March 20th, invoked the Defense Production Act. Now these actions made numerous emergency response actions available, including opening distribution capacities in the private sector, enabling potential agency actions, providing financial aid to the states and more. And these measures have been renewed or continued for, for months since invocation. Now, states, localities and tribes also declared emergencies in response to the pandemic. In an unprecedented response, every state in the United States was under an emergency, disaster, or public health emergency declaration by the end of March 2020. You can see kind of some of the different declarations that were used in different states. Uh, these declarations all varied according to specific state, tribal, or local laws, but they authorized broad public health emergency powers, including testing, screening, contact tracing, surveillance, and much more. As we are all well aware, uh, President Joe Biden took office in January 2021 and immediately acted to respond to the pandemic conceptualized as a national security threat. Under President Biden's new national strategic plan, uh, the president proposed to beat COVID-19 with a response driven by science, data, and public health, not politics. The plan includes restoring trust with Americans, a comprehensive vaccination campaign, mitigating spread through public health standards, expanding emergency relief through invocation of the Defense Production Act, reopening schools, business and travel, and uh, finally taking actions to improve health equity across racial, ethnic and geographic lines. The economic effects of the pandemic are clear. Estimates suggest that the potential for net losses in U.S. GDP over the next couple of years could reach anywhere between $3.2 to $4.8 trillion. Additionally, as of February 2021, U.S. adults reporting food insecurity rose from 3.4% pre-pandemic to 11% as of February 2021, and roughly 17% of adult renters reported being behind on rent payments. Overall, consumer spending dropped 3.9% during 2020, which is the steepest decline that we've seen since 1932. Now, numerous economic relief efforts were implemented in attempts to curb or stave off the worst of these economic consequences of the pandemic. On March 27th, 2020, the $2.09 trillion CARES Act passed, authorizing stimulus checks, business and student loan relief, and providing additional funds for state and local government response efforts. On December 27, 2020, the Consolidated Appropriations Act for 2021 authorized $2.3 trillion more, including relief uh, related to additional stimulus payments, additional small business loans, expanding Medicare access to mental health services via telehealth, and more. And most recently, on March 11, 2021, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act, authorizing $1.9 trillion more in relief, including $350 billion in support for state and local governments, individual stimulus payments, and billions more in funding for research, vaccination efforts, and public health wor workforce support. So these efforts and more all told add up to an estimated 
16 trillion dollars in U.S. spending for COVID-19 up to date, and the pandemic is is not over yet. Now, out of all of these emergency response efforts, perhaps the most widely contested in court are social distancing measures, and these include things like school and business closures, curfews, restricting public gatherings, stay-at-home orders, and travel restrictions. So these orders are intended to create safe spaces between people who could spread disease, help tamp down infection rates, and ultimately save lives in those circumstances where effective treatments and vaccines are unavailable. Uh, vaccines have become available uh, December 2020 and in the beginning of 2021, but for a large portion of 2020, uh, we were operating under these kind of social distancing conditions, waiting for those vaccines to arrive. Now that said, the, the unintended consequences of these social distancing orders can't be minimized. Um, more than 69 million unemployment claims resulted throughout the pandemic. As people stayed home, consumption dropped, jobs were eliminated, and over 100,000 individual businesses closed. Millions of Americans faced food insecurity and waited in long lines at food banks. And tenants were saved from the threat of eviction in some instances only by a federal eviction moratorium. So ultimately, all of these actions, responses, and effects culminated in a veritable tsunami of litigation across the country, challenging emergency social distancing orders as violating individual constitutional rights on all manner of bases. Uh, and some some groups are tracking these filings, and to date, over over 9,900 complaints have been filed, with over 2,000 in the labor and employment space alone. So this wave of litigation has resulted in some diverging approaches from courts across the country, exposing fundamental flaws and limitations in the current approaches. So challenges have arisen in all manner of areas. Orders have been challenged as violating the First Amendment's protection of expression, assembly, association, speech, and religion, the takings clause, equal protection or right to travel-based arguments, arguments uh, regarding reproductive freedoms, including the right to abortion, separation of powers, procedural and substantive due process, including businesses alleging violations of economic due process. And many of these arguments have been interwoven with the concept of judicial deference. So courts certainly had their work cut out for them with so many different arguments being made. Uh, much of the initial confusion in courts approaching challenges to emergency orders may stem from the Supreme Court's 1905 Jacobson versus Massachusetts opinion. In Jacobson, the court upheld a vaccination mandate in the context of a smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts expressly explaining that judicial review is appropriate when a statute purporting to have been enacted to protect the public health, public morals, or public safety has no real or substantial relation to those objects or is beyond all question a plain palpable invasion of rights secured by the fundamental law. This opinion has engendered differing approaches by courts attempting to discern whether or not to conduct judicial review in emergencies pursuant to this Jacobson standard. Now, two general judicial approaches have emerged. Uh, the first we term constitutional rebalancing, and this involves weight assessments of pliable individual rights with compelling governmental interests underlying those COVID-19 public health orders. These kinds of decisions reflect judges attempting to reconceive individual rights in emergency circumstances. Other decisions adopt the approach of constitutional set-asides, concluding that some individual rights may be temporarily set aside under emergency circumstances. So let's first address constitutional rebalancing. Within constitutional rebalancing, three general sub-approaches emerge. The first is an emergency or deferential approach, which assesses alleged rights-based infringements via the court's guidance in Jacobson or other emergency assessments. The second is an application of traditional tiered scrutiny, 
much like what courts would do in non-emergencies, applying rational basis, intermediate or strict scrutiny review. Finally, the third approach is an amalgam approach of courts applying both traditional scrutiny and Jacobson analyses in the same decision. Now, despite these somewhat varied, very varied approaches, uh, some general patterns emerge in rebalancing cases. First, where traditional tiers of scrutiny require uh, assessing the government interests at stake, courts essentially have acknowledged that these interests in the pandemic are compelling with little to no analysis. For example, in an early COVID-19 case in April 2020, a Kentucky federal district court assessed a plaintiff's First Amendment free exercise challenge to an executive order banning Easter church services. The court used traditional scrutiny, only briefly considering Jacobson's applicability, uh, and embarked on a long discussion of religious rights uh, while largely assuming the compelling nature of the government's interests without further elaboration. The courts have em employed this kind of approach throughout the pandemic, assuming the compelling nature of the government's interests and focusing analysis almost solely on whether the action at issue is appropriately tailored. And within that tailoring, rebalancing cases produce even more additional nuances. For example, in some strict scrutiny cases, courts have expressly viewed the boundaries of narrow tailoring as more expanded in an emergency. In a May 2020 case out of a California federal district court, a stay at home order was upheld against prospective protesters free speech challenges. And the court concluded that a blanket ban on protest permits did not intuitively ring of narrow tailoring but explained that what is narrow during a public health crisis is necessarily wider than usual. The same reasoning underlay a Southern District of New York decision upholding an order limiting non-essential gatherings. The court explained that while the measure would not likely be found narrowly tailored in ordinary times, these times are extraordinary. Beyond some of these nuances, at the heart of some of these rebalancing cases, is a mischaracterization of rights. And this has the potential to affect public health powers both during and outside of emergency circumstances. Some courts have actually called out litigants for mischaracterizing rights-based claims as impassable and unbending barriers to governmental action. For example, the Federal District of Hawaii dismissed a right to travel challenge to a 14-day state-based travel quarantine, explaining that Plaintiffs characterized the 14-day travel quarantine as a travel ban when it is not. In fact, the 14-day travel quarantine violated uh, neither of the components of the right to travel that the court had discussed. Still though, the court felt the need to justify the government's emergency response as reasonable in a pandemic. Rebalancing also in rare instances has resulted in upholding of mischaracterized rights. In May 2020, multiple business owners and politicians challenged Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf's social distancing measures on several grounds, including the freedom of assembly. The federal district court concluded in a September 2020 order that state limits on gatherings could not even satisfy rational basis scrutiny, as the governor's orders dissimilarly classified business and non business gatherings. The court concluded that doing so created a topsy-turvy world where plaintiffs are more restricted in areas traditionally protected by the First Amendment than in areas which usually receive far less, if any, protection. This kind of analysis implies a hardline view that the Constitution can never permit executive action placing potentially expressive activities in a less advantageous position than other kinds of activities, regardless of the risks posed. Now, the attempts to rebalance individual rights and communal objectives during emergencies have resulted in conflicting conclusions, even at the highest court in the nation. In May, on May 29, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court held that California's COVID-19 temporary limitations on religious assemblies outweighed congregants' First Amendment religious freedoms. 
Chief Justice Roberts explained that ruling otherwise would effectively result in judicial second guessing of executive decisions, contrary to separation of powers principles. After the confirmation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, and just six months after South Bay won, the court struck down a remarkably similar New York measure impacting places of worship as contrary to the free exercise of religion. In that decision, uh, Justice Gorsuch famously explained that even if the Constitution has taken a holiday during this pandemic, it cannot become a sabbatical. And finally, on February 5th, 2021, the court declared California's prohibition of indoor religious services unconstitutional, essentially reversing its opinion in the same case just eight months earlier. Justice Kagan's pointed dissent in South Bay 2 criticized the uncertainty that would result from the court's opinion, explaining that the court is injecting uncertainty into an area where that uncertainty has human costs. So let's move away from rebalancing and into constitutional set-asides. Set-asides differ from rebalancing in that these decisions are much more rare and ultimately result in courts justifying temporarily a set-aside of a constitutional right because of emergency circumstances. In Binford versus Sununu, uh, the court found an emergency standard applicable and rejected freedom of assembly and free exercise challenges to an order prohibiting gatherings of more than 50 people. The court concluded that fundamental rights may be temporarily limited or suspended in emergencies, so long as the action is taken in good faith and with some factual basis supporting its necessity. The right to abortion was also clearly implicated by the constitutional set-aside approach in two federal circuit court decisions issued early in the pandemic. The Fifth Circuit explained in In re Abbott that Jacobson instructs that all constitutional rights may be reasonably restricted to combat a public health emergency, allowing for suspension of elective abortions in the state temporarily during the PHE. Similarly, the Eighth Circuit found the lower court's failure to apply Jacobson to a similar restriction produced a patently erroneous result and that there could be no constitutional challenge unless the restriction had no real or substantial relation to the public health crisis. So the limitations of the set-aside approach are clear and were continuously highlighted by the Supreme Court in its decisions this past term. Even in a pandemic, as Justice Gorsuch stated, the Constitution cannot be put away and forgotten. Constitutional rights don't disappear during crises, and the judiciary is sworn to protect them even in emergency circumstances. Now, the limitations produced by the rebalancing approach may be less obvious. The approach is based on a rigid perspectives of rights in non-emergencies, where litigants and courts mischaracterize those rights with the potential for these mischaracterizations to alter the legal framework within and outside of emergencies. Additionally, discordance over which method to even employ means that dissonant outcomes result, highlighting the uncertainty that Justice Kagan warned against. Finally, second-guessing public health experts in the executive branch implicates strong separation of powers concerns, while complexities and confusion about the scope or limits of individual rights can paralyze public health actors, interrupting response. Now, I hope that this summary of our recent findings related to COVID-19 litigation is helpful. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jill, uh, who will walk through some of the legislative efforts. Jill? Thank you, Jen. Um, and yes, um, really pleased to be presenting um, and thanks for joining us, uh, those of you on the line. Um, our discussion is going to move now from the courts to our state legislatures and they've been busy. Um, literally hundreds of bills have been introduced in every state in the nation, not hundreds of bills in each state, but collectively. Um, and those bills address specific aspects of our COVID response. Um, and then many of the more troubling bills um, address emergency powers more broadly and public health authority more broadly. And so that's 
where I'll be focusing my discussion, my comments. And let's see, wrong way. Now, Jen began by talking about the unprecedented nature of the last year. And I fully acknowledge all of the many ways in which this has been an unprecedented year for all of us, um, which made this, this um, comment from Lisa Clute, a local health officer in North Dakota, in an article in The New Yorker, um, quite striking for me. She said pretty much everything that we ever talked about when we went through trainings on how to manage pandemics and bioterrorism has played out in this, with the exception that nobody ever talked about what to do if we weren't able to convince the public that this was serious. And I think that comment helps us, can help us understand what is happening in the state legislatures. Um, that we haven't um, been as well prepared as we might have been for um, for the skepticism that we've encountered. I mean, certainly we've been familiar with with vaccine hesitancy um, long before 2020 and 2021. Um, but the the skepticism and the misinformation um, from our government leaders. Um, has been driving, I would su submit, you know, a significant portion of the activity in our state legislatures. And um, it'll be helpful, I think, to, to delve into, so what is going on in our state legislatures before we can, um, you know, then continue the conversation about, so what do we do? So I, I would suggest that we have a, a triple threat confronting health officers, um, whether they're at the local, state, tribal, or federal level, um, uh, officers, practitioners, officials, and the like. Now, the first of these is actual threats to public health, the, the threats to physical health, um, the threats to our economic well being, um, to our, our social health, our mental and emotional and spiritual health. Um, <clears throat> are certainly significant aspects of the pandemic. But um, as, as forecast by that, that opening quote from, from Lisa Clute, there are two other levels of threat that, that perhaps we were less well prepared for. Um, threats to public health officials, harassment, um, you know, showing up outside Board of Health crowds, showing up at Board of Health meetings and burning masks. Um, and then the third threat is threats to public health authority. And, you know, that's important not because public health officials are, you know, and, and you know, other state leaders, governors and the like, not because um, as a group, that's a group of people that is power hungry, um, but because if we diminish public health authority, we diminish the likelihood that public health can respond effectively to future public health emergencies. So while that first category of threat is more than enough to be getting on with, um, those other two require our attention as well. Um, and, you know, as you know, we're focusing on that third level of threat. So there's a well, well known uh, classic definition of public health law. And I think, um, Frankly, it was highlighted quite well in, in Jen's presentation, the, the, the tension between the, the legal powers and duties of government um, with individual liberties. Um, but in my presentation, I'm gonna narrow in on that right-hand side um, to delve further into which government, which powers and duties, because that's the tension that we're seeing play out in our state legislatures. Um, which, which level of jurisdiction are we, you know, which government power should, should have the power, currently has the power, should have the power? Um, is it uh, the federal government, tribal governments, state governments, local governments? And which branch of government? Should it be the executive branch, the legislative, the judicial? That's, um, you know, that's what, uh, where a lot of the controversy and um, reactivity, I think, is happening. So, 
to provide an overview. Now, I, I mentioned there are hundreds of bills, so we can't possibly um, discuss all of those in, in any level of detail in, in just a few minutes here together. But we can get a sense of the parameters, the contours of the types of bills that are being introduced. So the, the first type I would just categorize as those that are addressing um, some of those specific uh, social distancing and community mitigation measures that, that have been put in place to address COVID-19, whether that be business closures um, or closures of, of other um, public gathering places, um, mask mandates, um, concerns about um, actual or potential vaccine mandates, whether that be from employers or colleges and universities um, or the like, um, or, or public venues with the concern about will I be you know, required that some have raised about being required to, to demonstrate that one has been vaccinated to gain access to go to a concert, for example. Um, Frankly, that first category of bills is is critically important. There are, you know, policy differences to be explored there. There are, you know, real life consequences of of those bills. Um, should they be adopted into law? And some of them are being adopted into law. Um, that said, many of them are explicitly on their face limited to the response to COVID-19. So my focus today is what about those more far reaching bills that are not limited? They're being shaped by the context of COVID-19, but they are not limited textually to the COVID-19 response. And so these bills limit or reassign emergency powers across the board. They limit or reassign public health authority across the board. And it's not clear that we've had enough discussion, dialogue, debate about those decisions to be enacting laws. So some of what's what's influencing, you know, some of the, the conversation that's swirling around just yesterday, uh, Politico had a story, the end of the imperial governorship. Um, you know, state lawmakers are seeking to reduce and, and um, contain the emergency powers of governors. Um, that's some of the discussion, we're all familiar with it, but we may not be familiar with, we may not be fully um, have grasped the, the breadth of the response in state legislatures. Um, so this map was created based on data from the National Conference of State Legislatures and then um, LexisNexis and StateNet created the map but what it illustrates really clearly is those states in dark blue are states that have already addressed, um, uh, excuse me, already passed laws um, to limit the powers of the emergency powers of governors. And the other blue states, um, you know, some 38 or so of them have pending bills. And this is as of two weeks ago. Um, so most states, 44 states have had bills introduced to address this perceived problem. So we'll just look at one example of these bills and it is one of the bills that has passed, Senate Bill 22 in Ohio. And what this bill does, uh, this law, it limits the length of, state of, emer of states of emergencies unless, as declared by the governor, unless they are approved by the General Assembly. Um, it permits the General Assembly to terminate a state of emergency after a specified number of days. Um, permits the General Assembly to rescind emergency orders and rules. Um, now, this the, it's an interesting path. We, we can think of this in the popular press as a partisan issue, but the politicization of the public health response and the emergency response to COVID-19 is not solely a partisan issue. Um, in fact, the the um, General Assembly is, is um, has a majority of Republicans, and the governor is also a Republican. The governor vetoed the bill, but the legislature overrode the governor's veto, and so the law it has been passed into law. So. Important to note that that these bills have not passed exclusively 
you know, they, they're a, a bipartisan, um, to some extent, there is bipartisan support in some states for these types of bills. Now, what are the implications of these bills or why should we be concerned? Well, because for emergency response, the way, the reason that these powers have resided with the executive is the time is frequently of the essence. And, you know, if you've ever tried to make a decision with one other person, um, you know, it can take longer. And so the idea is that we reside that authority in one person for, for speed. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one simple concern. Um, let's see. I want to keep track of time here. We'll move on. I'm just going to highlight some examples of the types of bills that we're, we're seeing. Another, another sort of category of bill that we're seeing um, is exemplified by Senate Bill 1 in Michigan, requiring legislative or gov gubernatorial approval um, in order to extend an emergency order um, issued by the state health officer. So the purpose here is is to have you know other decision makers in the mix. Um, that bill was vetoed by the governor, um, but there are similar bills in a number of other states. And again, it's a it's a proposal to change not just with respect to COVID nineteen, but to overhaul emergency powers and how those orders would be issued um, or continued for all future emergencies in the state of Michigan. Um, and so that bill has not passed into law. Another example of another type of category, the third category that I'm going to discuss out of four is Senate Bill 2006 in Florida. Now this bill uh, grants the state governor and legislature the authority to strike local ordinances and policies. Um, if they are if they unnecessarily restrict individual rights. Um, now, this is an example uh, <clears throat> of a sort of, of preemptive law where the state government, typically a preemptive law would simply prevent the local um, jurisdiction from, from passing an ordinance or, or order at all. In this case, it, it gives the state the, the power to um, invalidate those orders. So it's not exactly a classic preemptive law. But in any case, one concern about this particular law, and it may not be typical of laws in other states, is that it requires um, the governor or the state legislature to interpret those local policies and determine whether they unnecessarily restrict individual rights. Well, we just spent much of Jen's uh, presentation discussing um, how the courts <laughs> are carrying out that function. So there is a separation of powers concern um, with this law, um, as well as public health. Often the, the theory is that with an infectious disease, particularly, again, not with COVID, but if we think about future outbreaks, whether it be measles or chickenpox or, um, you know, any other infectious disease, um, it may be that those local officials are best situated to make judgments um, based on the data and based on their sense of the community, how to respond. Um, so for the state to have the authority to override that um, would not be consistent with how we've traditionally conceptualized, um, you know, emergency preparedness and, and legal responses. Would be a departure from, from that customary. Um, approach. Now, one class of bills, the fourth category that I'm going to discuss, um, would remove, um, would re would diminish the authority of local boards of health and health officers by requiring um, the uh, approval of elected officials, whether that might be a city council, a county board. Um, the particular bill um, that I'm bringing before you is House Bill 121 from the state of Montana. Now this, this bill um, has been through the legislative, throughout the legislative process, there have been a number of amendments to the bill as concerns have been raised. That's not necessarily been the case, um, you know, in every state. Some of these bills have, have moved forward pretty rapidly with with uh, without much um, sort of legislative back and forth. But in the case of Montana, there have been some amendments. 
um, there was an amendment, there was, there was a concern raised um, that this bill seemed much uh, to uh, address all of public health authority. And so there was an amendment made um, essentially saying, well, there's no intent here to address non-emergency actions. Um, now applying that to, to determine what constitutes a non-emergency action um, and whether that, that lack of it, this, that disavowal of a t intent to address those non-emergency actions um, will be sufficient to override the, the, the language in the other sections, probably. Um, but but it, it raises some uncertainty and, and shows kind of the haste of the process and perhaps suggests that having a little more time to, to think this through um, you know, and assess the COVID-19 response and consider other potential applications of this bill um, might be helpful. Um, currently, this, this bill is on the governor's desk. I, I checked yesterday. Um, it was submitted to the governor on April 6th, so we, we certainly expect action um, fairly soon. Interestingly, the state of Montana has a, a law that would permit what is called an amendatory veto where the governor can send a bill back to the state legislature with suggestions for changes. And there has been some discussion that that may happen in the state of Montana. Um, but in general, this category of bills has certainly received less attention than the bills that would um, reduce the, um, the authority of governors to uh, um, institute emergency orders or increase the legislature's ability to um, speak to the time frames um, or the renewal of, of those um, emergency orders. This class of bills has received less attention in the popular press, but I would submit could have a really profound effect on public health, um, public health law and public health practice um, and is worth um, paying attention to. Um, these bills are being introduced in, in quite a few states. Um, and certainly there's been some advocacy in some of those states, um, including in Montana. Montana has um, a, a number of uh, individuals um, uh, in, affiliated with the public health community and concerned about community health, including the American Heart Association, um, worked with a polling firm um, to contact, um, to survey um, residents of Montana and ask questions about um, you know, this to probe this this um, sense that public health had waited, um, you know, had focused too much on health um, <laughs> in the response to COVID-19 and, and not given due attention to the economic effects of, of the um, community mitigation and social distancing measures. Um, but, but, you know, overwhelmingly Montanans agreed that to have a healthy economy, you need a healthy workforce. And similarly, Montana voters, um, contrary to concerns that have been raised about you know, unelected bureaucrats is sort of the phrase that's used, um, contrary to the concerns about unelected bureaucrats making decisions um, in response to a public health emergency, um, by a four to one ratio, Montana voters um, said that we trust health officials more than politicians. So interesting um, data, and certainly one could uh, quarrel with the survey um, and, and some of the advocates for the bill in Montana have done so. But uh, that said, it's, it's um, providing different messaging in support of public health authority as it has historically been conceived. So shortcuts can make for long delays, right? Um, Sweeping changes, when we're talking about the kinds of sweeping changes that these bills would make, um, shortcuts may have entirely foreseeable and unforeseen consequences. So it may make sense before we rush to litigate to engage in an honest examination and assessment of our COVID response, um, both as a nation and individual states and localities, um, look at the strengths and weaknesses, as well as thinking beyond the COVID-19 context when we think about um, and propose changes to our framework for emergency response and for public health authority more generally. So that said, um, due to time constraints of this presentation, 
um, it, I've focused on the threat of unforeseen consequences of these four categories and types of bills that have been introduced in numerous states across the country. And there's a certain sense in which that focus on a defensive posture in reaction to these bills that have been introduced mirrors um, what has happened um, in the state as public health officials and public health associations and other um, organizations, um, stakeholders concerned with health have responded, um, you know, uh, to uh, with concern about some of these bills that have been introduced. Um, all the while responding to that 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 first of the triple threats, the, the ongoing threat to public health. And so we're still focused on COVID response, vaccine distribution, um, but there's an overwhelming weight and coordination of those um, seeking to, to uh, restructure and reframe our public health response. And so that does necessitate a defensive or has dictated a defensive response. But all of that said, um, there have been some bills um, that could provide opportunities for public health and public health authority. Um, broadly speaking, they could clarify public health authority and emergency powers rather than limiting them. Clarify how those take place when we're not just talking about isolation and quarantine, but we're talking about um, social distancing, um, you know, of community members who um, haven't been identified as specifically having a disease or having been exposed to it. Um, bills that propose a commission or a task force to take a pause and, and um, have a deeper study of this before proposing sweeping statutory changes. Um, to take seriously the disparities that have been um, shown in stark relief in, in COVID-19 in terms of morbidity and mortality. And so um, some states have established health equity task forces, issued declarations of racism as a public health crisis. A handful of states have said, this has illuminated, this event has illuminated um, chronic underinvestment in public health and have proposed increased investments in public health infrastructure and workforce. Um, and that's something where we're going to be turning our attention to um, studying more of those types of bills. Um, and that, that second threat that we talked about, that threat um, um, to public health officials in the performance of their job duties, laws that would protect them from threats and harassment when performing their duties. Um, finally, laws, bills that might address, um, take a health and all policies approach that takes seriously the impact of environmental laws, transportation laws, um, takes health seriously um, when we uh, are regulating education and the like. So there are opportunities for a positive response, um, particularly after we've had a time um, to assess our COVID response and identify legal um, strengths and shortcomings. Um, here are some additional resources I wanted to share. Otherwise, I'll um, turn things over to Lindsay. Is the video working? I've been having technical difficulties. My laptop has been freezing. Yes, this yes. is Donna. Yes. I can see you. I oh, hope good. everybody else can. Great. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> if uh, if things freeze up, I'll just keep going, and hopefully, um, hopefully, you, I'll, I'll still be connected. I'm so sorry uh, in advance for any technical difficulties. Apparently, my laptop just despises WebEx more than any other platform. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for making time to join the discussion today. Uh, in my work, I've been trying to um, do some of that examination, some of that deliberation and discussion about what comes next in terms of legislative reforms that are prompted really as part of a backlash against the orders that have been issued in, uh, the, in response to COVID-19, uh, but uh, creates an opportunity, as Jill put it, to clarify rather than strip uh, public health emergency preparedness authorities, public health emergency order authorities uh, in the executive branch. So my approach has been to respond to some of the uh, draconian proposals to strip emergency response powers uh, that Jill uh, uh, just reviewed by offering less draconian options to be substituted in their place. Um, my starting point is that many of the orders issued in 2020 and 2021 have been life-saving. 
but there have been instances of executive overreach and poor decision making. Um, in addition, the lack of specific statutory authorization for many of the orders issued in response to COVID has meant that they are more vulnerable to court challenges, as we've seen, particularly in um, Michigan and Wisconsin and in, in some other places as well. Um, I want to clarify, though, that I'm focusing particularly on social distancing and face covering orders, and I do not define social distancing orders to include isolation and quarantine of individuals. Um, so the isolation and quarantine of individuals based on suspected or known infection or exposure, that is authorized in specific terms in most states. But orders um, restricting business operations, even orders prohibiting gatherings, um, as well as orders uh, mandating face coverings, are not authorized in specific terms in most state statutes. And so that's where my focus is in terms of a gap that has really hindered our pandemic response and that really should be addressed going forward. For the next public health emergency, we need to put these kinds of orders on firmer footing with specific statutory authorizations. In addition, I think it's fair to argue that current statutes um, with, that many governors have relied on, which many governors have relied on general emergency and disaster management statutes rather than anything that's specific to public health, I argue that the statutes most governors are relying on don't provide sufficient procedural safeguards or substantive standards to guide the issuance and enforcement of orders for face coverings and social distancing among the general population, regardless of any known or suspected infection or exposure. Many states and the federal CDC do have those specific substantive standards and procedural protections for individually targeted measures but not for the measures in the general population. So I think we're likely on the decade, not just of a year of hundreds of bills, but probably on, a, on the cusp of a new decade of reforms, regulatory and legislative, um, federal, state, and, and even local. And I've written about the principles that I believe should guide those reforms. And I'm struggling. It doesn't look like I have the menu that lets me advance my slide. So I, uh, I might see it. Let's see. Is it working? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, nope. Uh, I'm so sorry for the technical problems and for my computer's hatred of WebEx. So, um, one of the first principle that I've argued should guide reforms is that authorities to issue compulsory social distancing and face covering orders should be contingent on a public health emergency declaration relying on general emergency and disaster management statutes, as many governors have done in the past year, or relying on general public health authorities that aren't contingent on any kind of formal declaration, has provided gap filling over the last year, but it isn't ideal. We need to put these measures on firmer footing than that provides and provide more uh, uh, specific statutory authorizations and uh, guardrails that are uh, specifically tailored to these kinds of orders. Not all public health authorities should be contingent on a declaration. As we all know, there are many situations in which health officials need to be able to issue individually targeted isolation, quarantine, or condemnation orders to protect public health in routine times from threats like drug-resistant tuberculosis or sexually transmitted infections. But these generally applicable compulsory orders to stay at home, to close businesses or limit capacity, to wear masks, and so on, these shouldn't be issued pursuant to routine public health authority, as some state governors uh, and state health officers have relied on. They also shouldn't be based on general disaster and emergency management statutes that don't require evidence tailored to communicable disease threats. Um, these are highly disruptive measures, and they should be contingent on emergency declarations triggered by criteria and governed by procedural protections and substantive standards that are specifically designed to assess and respond to infectious disease threats. Um, the Model Emergency State Health Powers Act provides a pretty good framework for the basic emergency declaration in the public health space, but it needs to be amended to address social distancing and PPE requirements that apply to the general public regardless of known or suspected. Exposure. So under the, under the Model Act, which was developed in the aftermath of the 2001 jetliner and anthrax attacks, um, public health emergency declarations are limited to occurrences or threats caused by either bioterrorism 
or the appearance of a novel or previously controlled or eradicated infectious agent or biological toxin. I think this definition could be even further refined to ensure that um, the kinds of orders that we've issued in 2020 and 2021 are not triggered by more routine threats, even if they are infectious, but also that they're not triggered by threats for which the severity of the threat does not justify these kinds of orders. So let's see if I can find the special menu again to hover and change. Great. Second, I argue that declarations should be time limited, but they should be unilaterally renewable with a clearly defined mechanism for legislative override following ordinary processes of legislation. In terms of the details of the procedural safeguards that should apply by statute, if the legislature disagrees with the executive branch, it can take affirmative steps to intervene. Um, but the default in the absence of legislative action to take the reins and um, manage the crisis should be ongoing authority for the executive to respond to the emergency. Um, the toughest question here, I think, is whether a veto proof majority should be required for legislative override. I'm not sure that's a, the right approach. On the other hand, empowering a small legislative commission to not only lift orders, but prohibit any substantially similar order from being issued um, strikes me as really dangerous. I think the appropriate middle ground is the majority approach currently in most state emergency and disaster management statutes, which is that a simple majority resolution vote of both chambers of the state legislature is sufficient to nullify a declaration without requiring a veto proof majority on the one hand, and without empowering a small legislative commission that could act quickly to lift orders without putting anything in their place on the other. Third, I argue that transparency should be mandated by statute. And uh, I've written that this should include disclosure of the strategic purpose that orders are intended to serve, which should be described in more specific terms than combat COVID-19, as well as the best available scientific understanding on which orders are based um, and the criteria that will be used to determine whether they should be reconsidered or adjusted or lifted. This is my effort to hash out a middle ground between the kind of rights to notice and comment or administrative hearings that govern individually targeted public health orders on the one hand and the administrative processes that govern generally applicable hearing uh, rules on the other. So the generally applicable public health emergency orders being issued for social distancing and face covering are different. They're not a good fit for the procedural protections aimed at ensuring individualized risk assessment, like individual hearings where conflicting medical testimony can be presented, but they're also not a good fit for general administrative procedures like notice and comment rulemaking. Statutes in many cases provide an exception that sweeps away notice and comment requirements, but it often doesn't really put anything in, in, its, in, that, in the place of those requirements in terms of procedural protections. So fourth, I recommend that states should authorize a graded range of alternatives to facilitate a scaled and sustainable response. A targeted approach based on risk, which can be assessed by experts in real time, and public priorities, which can and I argue should be determined in advance with legislative guidance, minimizes disruption while maximizing benefits. Um, there are some proposals in the, in the bills that Jill was describing that would prohibit what, what some critics call categorical restrictions. I think that's kind of a confusing term, but what they mean by that is they don't want orders to pick winners and losers by singling out particular kinds of businesses or settings like restaurants or bars or gyms. I argue that um, statutes should not take any intervention off the table as a matter of statutory requirements in advance when it's impossible to characterize the nature of the threat. And in fact, that kind of prohibition on categorical restrictions that restrict certain businesses that are determined to present higher risks of transmission could actually um, end up uh, prompting this kind of all or nothing response that, and we saw that kind of all or nothing thinking really be problematic throughout the last year. So um, one example that I've used is, you know, even if you, if you don't believe that bars and restaurants should be restricted before other things should be restricted. Think about something like a waterborne infection, like polio, where you would want to be able to close swimming pools, um, but not other businesses. So anything that's prohibiting that kind of uh, line drawing exercise 
um, would undermine a scaled and sustainable response to a future public. Fifth, I argued that, and this gets tricky in light of the most recent Supreme Court decisions, but statutory standards should promote neutral orders that don't discriminate on the basis of religion. Now, I want to acknowledge that this may no longer be enough as the Supreme Court's new shadow docket decisions seem to be embracing, fully embracing, um, as of last Friday, a most favored nation doctrine for houses of worship and religious activities while providing very little in the way of guidance as to what restrictions on religious gatherings or houses of worship would be constitutionally permissible. Um, nonetheless, I argue that um, statutes should not go further than the Constitution clearly requires at this point. We shouldn't jump the gun and enact something like a RIFRA provision specific to public health emergency orders. Instead, statutes should empower and guide executives to uh, use risk-based distinctions and to define gathering in neutral and specific terms that are based on the risks of transmission that can then be applied potentially to religious gatherings, but can uh, vitiate the need to specifically impose uh, uh, restrictions that single out religious gatherings. Now, that sort of neutral gathering order has found to be problematic in the most Supreme, recent Supreme Court cases. So it may, as I said, no longer be enough to take this approach. Um, I just want to take a moment to say that part of the problem here is that the comparators keep changing um, from Roberts's adoption of concerts and lectures to Kavanaugh's adoption of grocery stores and liquor stores to the recent reliance in, in Supreme Court filings, um, at least uh, on the San Jose airport as the right comparison. Um, at some point, there are things that are of such high priority, I mean, hospitals come to mind, that they stay open without any density limits in spite of the high risk of transmission. Um, the court's shadow docket decisions on, these, on this issue haven't yet provided much guidance to navigate this, but in the meantime, statutes shouldn't impose categorical across-the-board exemption for religious gatherings or for houses of worship. So sixth, um, I argue that legislatures should mandate provision of supports, legal protections, and accommodation of safer alternatives to prohibited or restricted activities within available means. So this is one of the more controversial and, and less successful of my proposals, but I'm not ready to give it up yet. Um, I argue that to enable voluntary compliance and minimize um, unjust distribution of the benefits and burdens of public health intervention, it's critical to kind of marry restrictions with facilitating supports. And it's hard to mandate any kind of affirmative obligation on the part of government to provide those supports, but it is possible in a statute to con condition authority to issue restrictions on a kind of progressive realization principle that would allow courts to conduct judicial review and determine uh, or at least interrogate whether executive branch officials have within their available resources, within the resources available to that branch at that jurisdictional level, um, have taken steps to provide facilitating supports to provide to accommodate safer alternatives to restricted activities and to provide legal protections um, as well, particularly for, for workplaces and, um, and institutional settings. So this principle of progressive realization is borrowed from human rights and from global public health law. It's a requirement to provide those supports within the means that are available. Um, we can talk about it more in the discussion, but a real challenge here um, in this space generally and on this recommendation in particular is that there's incredible fragmentation between state and local leaders who hold the reins on restrictions and the federal government, which is in many cases the sole entity with the financial means um, or supply chain coordination to provide sufficient supports um, uh, to ramp up more targeted interventions that are less disruptive and to provide financial support to enable people to comply with social distancing recommendations. But including this principle of progressive realization requirement in a statute, um, by doing that, my hope is to highlight that the legislature has an expectations that it, expectation that administrative agencies, health officials, other executive branch officials will do what they can within available resources. Finally, as I continue to get uh, more on the controversial side in these recommendations, the seventh principle that I've governed, that I've advocated should govern reform um, is that criminal enforcement 
against individuals for the purposes of social distancing and face covering should only be used as a last resort. That, that really should be justified as a least restrictive alternative. Um, statutes should authorize criminal enforcement um, against individuals who violate social distancing orders and mask mandates if it is the least restrictive alternative available to achieve compliance. Off officials should be required to exhaust other options, for example, inspections and administrative penalties for businesses before turning to criminal sanctions and policing of individuals. Um, for measures that do not invoke criminal enforcement against individuals, statutory standards should not impose greater requirements for justification than constitutional standards do. And this is a tricky one for me. Um, like many of you, I went into this pandemic sort of assuming that the least restrictive alternative and requirements of individualized risk assessment would be required for a lot more of the kinds of business and travel restrictions than has turned out to be the case in the courts. I've come around to the idea that these measures are not as intrusive as individually targeted quarantine orders. So the least restrictive alternative isn't necessary, necessarily appropriate for those provisions. I do not support Alex's approach, which would impose a least restrictive alternative or strict scrutiny by statute where it hasn't been imposed by the courts as a matter of constitutional constraints. But there is a line for me when it comes to criminal enforcement against individuals. At that point, it starts to look more intrusive, more like individual quarantine orders. And I think there's more of a need for the strong justification and individualized assessment of the risk of transmission and the likelihood of non-compliance with a voluntary recommendation that the LRA standard involves. So I'll just conclude with one parting reflection here to, to launch the discussion maybe on the interplay between these state legislative reform efforts and what I view as potentially expanding federal authority, or at least expanding and more expansive interpretations of what CDC can do under Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act. I, I'm concerned that if state legislation to strip or at least sharply constrain state executive powers passes in many states, there could actually be even greater pressure for the federal CDC to step in using Section 361 based on a finding that state and local responses are inadequate to prevent the interstate spread of disease. Um, 2020 precedents now con contradicted by some 2021 precedents um, on CDC's eviction moratorium order suggests that CDC's power may be far more expansive than some of us may have assumed, which has prompted me to call for federal regulation based on similar principles to what I'm recommending in this presentation for state legislation. Whether that would be a good outcome is something we can debate. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A and I will end there. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists, Jen, Jill, and Lindsay. And um, certainly pop back on and onto your uh, on the video. That would be fabulous. So I'm going to try to uh, field these questions to to all of you and uh, try to steer them to one or another. But please feel free to jump in. Dialogue is is fine. Uh, I want to start with one. Uh, Jen, just the first one is, uh, if you know off the top of your head, we've been asked, are there any states where there are no longer a declared emergency? Do you know that? And then I have a I, follow up. I do. There are two state Supreme Courts that have gotten rid of governor declarations of emergency, and those states are Michigan and Wisconsin. Additionally, Alaska is not currently under a state of emergency. Uh, I don't know any other states off the top of my head. Lindsay or Jill, if you know any additional ones, please chime in. Lindsay, is, are you off your? Yeah. So there's one interesting development I'll just add in Texas where Governor Abbott in public health emergency declaration, but maintained the disaster declaration. And what's interesting about that is that he's using the disaster de declaration at this point to uh, preempt local authority to mandate vaccinations, including presumably for local government uh, employees or even for school uh, attendees. And he's also using it to order businesses, uh, prohibit businesses from requiring proof of vaccination for patrons. We've seen that in, in a few different states at this point. It's just interesting to me that um, in, in, in Texas, he lifted the public health emergency declaration, which actually specifically 
authorizes the state health officer to preempt local public health authority, but then that's left him using a less strong preemption authority under the disaster management statute, which simply allows him to suspend state laws, but it has some language, a substantive standard there where it allows him to suspend state laws if he can show, if there's a finding that, um, that enforcement of those state laws would hinder the disaster response. So it may actually make his preemption of local authority more vulnerable to legal challenge than if he had left the public health emergency declaration in place, which he clearly lifted primarily for public health, for kind of pol political theater. Interesting. Well, this this um, follows on that. So the, the question we received is, if a state rescinds its emergency order, will that preclude them from federal emergency benefits that may be available, um, like financial benefits, even if a federal emergency still exists? Um, anyone can feel that. Well, that's that's been an issue in the state of Wisconsin after um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court um, overturned Governor Evers emergency mask order. And so the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau um, opined that there will be a reduction in benefits um, under the CARES Act, the, the additional SNAP benefits through the CARES Act, though this is all kind of happening um, fairly recently, so there may be some work around that this was raised uh, a few months ago as well in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so it's that's that's what the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau has opined. Um, we'll we'll have to watch. Okay, uh, next question for Jennifer. You characterized evictions, hunger, and job losses as the result of public health policies rather than as a result of the virus itself. Why? So this is a, a very good question. And first, at base level, I want to say that without COVID-19, none of those public health orders would have been necessary. So of course, at base level, all of the results that we're seeing are the results of the virus. But I also think that it's important to understand, and this kind of builds on what Lindsay was saying recently about having supports paired with your public health orders or your public health actions, because at some point, in order to, to prevent morbidity, to prevent mortality, these orders became necessary. And some of these orders were closing businesses. And some of the results of that is that people don't have money to pay rent and they face eviction. And so it's very important, as Lindsay said, to kind of pair those orders, make sure that they're supported with, with governmental support so that people can get through and hold on while while complying with the public health emergency orders. Want to add anything to that? Okay, I'm gonna go on with another question here. So um Jill, do you have any suggestions of what we should do now if we live in a state with a pending bill that may threaten public health authority and limit our our ability to respond effectively to public health emergencies? Um, sure. I mean, you should figure out who in the <clears throat> who among your network has um, who cares about public health has capacity to engage in advocacy. Learn about the bills. Um, there are various national organizations tracking them. ASTO, the Heart Association, the National Conference of State Legislatures. So you can keep up to date through through their bill tracking. Um, you can. Talk to legal expert, experts, law professors like Lindsay are often willing to help you understand the impact of the laws, whether there are any constitutional concerns about them. Um, and frequently, depending on any restrictions, obviously abide by any restrictions upon lobbying, but in Ohio, we saw um, various local health departments or, or boards of health, the Association of Ohio Health Officers um, wrote you know, wrote to the governor requesting him to veto the bill. Um, we saw, you know, we've seen the strategy in Montana um, where the American Heart Association and others have surveyed the public to try and get a sense of, is this really what the voters want? Are these bills what the voters want? Um, and getting, getting, um, getting that information out there. So there's lots, um, I think that can be done, connecting with stakeholders, 
um, looking for unlikely allies. Maybe, maybe you think business isn't going to be supportive, but, but perhaps some businesses would be. Um, but all of this is a heavy lift if everybody in your public health system is, is focused on COVID response and vaccine, you know, getting shots in arms. So it's a matter of finding those who, who maybe would have that capacity. So, thank you. Speaking of sh shots in arms, we have a, a one. I'll start with Lindsay. What um, are your views about the usefulness and potential concerns of COVID status certificates or vaccine passports? Um, how should they be regulated? Will they benefit public health without compromising data privacy? I think this has been like many things throughout the pandemic. Um, incredibly politicized, which is unfortunate. Uh, I think the, uh, I honestly think the efforts in some places to push, you know, vaccine passports at the state and local level are, are political. They're, they're about signaling. And I think efforts obviously to preempt or promise that there won't be vaccine passports are clearly political and about signaling as well. I also think this kind of combines all of the politicization of mask mandates with the kind of technological solutionism of the contact tracing app, really exposure notification apps. And my guess is, um, and I've seen others suggest the same, that by the time we get to the point where there's um, widespread access to vaccination to the point where it would be even conceivable that we would really you know, firmly require vaccination, um, I'm cautiously optimistic that at that point, will be improved to the extent that businesses will be far too eager to admit all comers, to take all comers, to, to really hold their ground on um, requiring business patrons, you know, to attend a basketball game, to go to a restaurant, um, to go to the trouble of requiring vaccination in those contexts. I think what we're far more likely to see, what we're already seeing, and, and my university just jumped on this bandwagon yesterday, is vaccination requirements as a condition of university and college. I think we'll see that. We're already seeing it. I think it'll be harder to count the universities that don't require that before uh, before much longer. Um, I think we'll continue to see interest in vaccination requirements for certain um, occupations. You know, we have the first legal challenge to a requirement um, for a corrections officer brought by a corrections officer against a mandate to be vaccinated as a condition of employment. I think that will be a space to continue to watch. And I do think we'll see in terms of international travel, um, some vaccination certificate requirements as we have for yellow fever. Um, but the idea that we need this heavily kind of technological platform and that it's gonna solve all our problems, um, I think is, is overstated as a practical matter. It's interesting though, because I think the, the I think a lot of people who are pushing this idea see it as a way to increase vaccination rates, to increase acceptance of vaccination. Because if the, the narrative is, if you want to be able to go to an NBA game, you have to be vaccinated. The hope is that that's going to prompt more people to do so. But I think that might be a little bit misleading. Mm. Well, interesting. I wonder, Jen, uh, there's another question then that uh, really links to this one it, uh, it is how might future court decisions relating to vaccination change the legal landscape? Sure. So Lindsay just touched on on the first court case that we've actually seen. It's out of New Mexico, a New Mexico corrections officer who is challenging uh, the vaccination mandate. The argument there being that the vaccines that are currently out there are issued under an emergency use authorization and people have to have you know, the right to refuse or the right to accept uh, an emergency use product uh, and, and that that mandate in, in some ways you know, eliminates that, that option. But whether or not the court actually buys into that argument is something that we'll have to watch. And, and this court case could very well be you know, the first of, of many court cases that we see across the country as as uh, as these challenges continue and as as more vaccines become available and therefore potentially more businesses employers uh, seek to implement those kinds of mandates. Uh, another kind of you know quirk of the recent Supreme Court decisions, though, is that we could very well potentially see evolution in the uh, religious exemptions to vaccination space. 
where the Supreme Court might start to very much elevate these kind of religious exemptions uh, to vaccination that currently constitutionally states do not have to provide. So it's it's going to be interesting to watch, definitely. Great, thank you. Uh, here's one, I think for Jill, if you could build this one, is there any lasting danger to having executives acting unilaterally by sus suspending or creating any regulations for over a year? Um, I mean, there are consequences. I mean, we have these laws presumably for a reason in ordinary times, these laws, um, the legislature has made the judgment that they should be in place. So is there a guarantee that there will be no adverse consequences? No, I, I, I can't pretend that there is. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what else. No, uh, any other yeah. thoughts? Yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, I mean, I. I think the answer is yes, there are consequences, there are risks, and we have to take those seriously um, and take concerns about executive overreach seriously. This is an enormous backlash um, by people who perceive that that major mistakes were made, particularly in the early months of this uh, pandemic. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves over time, but I suspect the 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 um, argument that there was overreach is likely to become more influential rather than less influential as the kind of fear of the pandemic recedes for everyday citizens uh, or Americans. Um, I, just to throw out a couple of examples, I do think it's important to keep in mind, you know, that the first case in which this Jacobson kind of suspension or set asides um, argument was made was in a case where the pandemic was used, I think, as complete pretext to halt all abortion-related care in several states. And that was the context in which the Fifth Circuit said, well, Jacobson um, overrules Casey versus Planned Parenthood and Roe versus Wade indefinitely, potentially. Um, I think it's important to take that seriously. Uh, I, I think the courts have a role to play. I think individual rights ha do have to be balanced against public health necessities. And most importantly, I think we need both statutory guardrails and constitutional doctrines that require health officials and, and really also important to keep in mind, it's governors, not health officials for the most part who have been issuing these restrictions, but require those officials to articulate their reasoning in a public and transparent and honest way and to have this kind of deliberation. We've talked a lot about following the science, but the science needs to inform this discussion. It cannot provide every answer. There's also deliberation about values, deliberation about competing interests that has to be part of this. Um, and in a, in a democracy preserving a, a role for individual rights, preserving a role for the rule of law, is is the the sort of basic field on which we have to manage emergency response. Thank you. Um, I have an interesting question here. Maybe it's for everyone. Given the misinformation seen over the course of the pandemic on many fronts, do you think it might be time to reinstate the fairness doctrine in the public health context and provide a right of reply to public health? spokespersons. I don't know how you would manage that or implement that, but that is a question we received in advance of this webinar and from one of the um, attendees right now. I'll, I'll jump in for a second and say, I think that's a really interesting idea, interesting kind of lawyerly argument. Um, I don't know that the problem is that public health spokespeople have not had a platform. I think they have. I just think they've lost the public's trust um, and, and so I don't know that an equal time or fairness doctrine um, would have a lot of traction in terms of really moving the needle on denialism of science. Um, if anything, if there's a perception that that public health spokesperson is speaking because the law demands it and Big Brother says they must be given a platform that could in some ways undermine mm -hmm. legitimacy and trust rather than support it. Any other contributions here from our panelists? We can leave it at that. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left before about four minutes left before I have to hand this back to Charles, but we do have more questions. So here's one um, 
in the judicial sphere, let me hand that first to Jen. If a person does not comply with public health measures, and because of that, another person or persons become ill, which may lead to a loss of job, money, medical costs, and maybe death, can the person who becomes ill or their family sue the non-complier? You know, I, I, I don't have a direct answer for this question because I don't uh, I don't have a lot of, of knowledge basis on this particular topic. Um, I, I don't, what I've been studying throughout this pandemic has been a lot of the challenges to kind of implementing these, uh, these COVID-19 social distancing orders and, and whether or not these infringe on individual rights. But gosh, I don't think I have come across a case where someone sued another person for giving them COVID because they weren't complying with an order. I, I, I think that's kind of beyond the, the bounds of my imagination at, the, at this moment. Anyone else have thoughts on this one? I think there have been assault charges brought um, in a couple of instances, but I don't know that tort suits have been brought. Um, and that was really egregious. It was um, in the context of uh, arguments, nearly fist fights about mask wearing, um, I, I believe there was an instance where someone spat on um, another person and there was and the kind of idea that there was fear of contracting COVID from that was was mentioned uh, in the discussion about assault charges there. So why don't we end with um, a pretty broad question? Um, what developments do you anticipate will be on the horizon over the next few weeks through the next few years with respect to the topic we've been dealing with today might start with uh, our professor there Lindsay so I'm gonna I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to to jump on um, uh, an argument or a question that was raised in the panel about sort of how do we convince uh, legislators uh, and governors in some places to proceed with caution in terms of stripping um, emergency response powers um, and the argument that I've tried to make uh, in these discussions is um, whatever you feel about what happened in March of 2020, whether you feel that was an overreaction or overreach or not, I can easily talk to you about a different threat that could come about in the future. Um, and uh, I think we need to be having a discussion. We need to rebuild trust around that not through fear, which is tricky, right? Because I think fear dissipates relatively quickly for people who are in a well-off position and able to protect themselves. But a discussion about how important it is not to tie the hands of health officials in the future, um, the idea that the restrictions that we're imposing on public health authority today could come back to haunt us in a decade, in two decades, in three decades, um, you know, the, the reforms of the past, including things like civil defense laws or kind of laws that were passed in response to the anti-Vietnam protests, that's the legal landscape that, that we're relying on in this crisis. The reforms that are passed in response to the backlash against the response to COVID um, are what we're going to be equipped with in a future crisis. And so having that discussion, I think, is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jill. Um, we're at the end of our time, so I'm going to just hand it over to Charles to wrap this up. And many thanks to our panelists and attendees. Great. Thanks, Donna. And thank you to our speakers for your insights. Um, just a few quick notes. All attendees will be receiving an email from the network with the video playback of this webinar, as well as a link to our brief webinar survey. The survey takes just one minute to fill out and provides us with some really great insights. Um, you'll also be receiving an email from ASLME with information on how to apply for CLE credits for this event. And finally, join us uh, for the 2021 Public Health Law Conference uh, this September in Baltimore. We hope to host the conference in person, but we will be providing updates um, to our registrants with developments uh, in the coming weeks and months. So. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.